it's my <coughs> it, it'll be my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. I'm Pete. I am the vice president who is supposed to be in charge of programs, although truth be told, Beth does the lion's share of <laughs> drumming up a lot of the speakers, which I totally appreciate. But I get the uh, pleasure of introducing um, Jim Prophet anyway. Um, Beth and I um, actually know Jim virtually from an online Facebook group called the Front Range Science Connection which is a public group for anybody that in, that's interested in interesting science stuff. And Jim is one of the regular posters to that group, which has sometimes included, so anyone can just look up Front Range Science Connection on Facebook and you can join it, okay? And, and his posts have sometimes included recently things about coloring things and including rocks and minerals. So um, Beth enlisted him to said, hey, he'd be a great speaker for our group and Jim is a, um, a, a, a chemist, a research chemist by background. He, um, he worked in, the, in the, the medical field and organic chemistry. He worked for Siemens Medical Diagnostics as a senior staff scientist. And so he's done a lot. Of, he's always had a fascination with light and color, which of course relates to chemistry and physics and, and other things. And um, I, if you didn't read all of his bio that was in the newsletter, it uh, says he's had um, uh, held or co-held dozens of US patents as an inventor. And he currently uses SolidWorks for 3D design and a combination of laser cutting and 3D printing to work out ideas. So this is on his own. He's retired now. So he's a cool guy. <laughs> and um, he's going to tell us a lot about what kinds of things give rocks and minerals their color, which is like, if they weren't colorful, I doubt that we'd collect most of them. And what if everything was shades of gray? What fun would that be at the mineral show? <laughs> so um, Jim, thank you for, for coming here. And thank you. I have a mic on. I'm going to use my notes actually to keep me on track because I might uh, get infatuated with science and will it be too dark? Oh, that would be fine. Can you still see? Uh, Is this fine. good now? That's very good. Okay, I'm going to get into, uh, well, the first thing I should say is, is I'm not a geologist, I'm not a gemologist, uh, I'm not a mineralogist. Uh, but where we have common ground is in light and color. Uh, you know, as Pete said, uh, you wouldn't know it's a pretty rock if you couldn't see it, and you can only see it because of the physics involved and the chemistry. Okay, um, let's go on. It should change. Oh, maybe we have to start it. Okay, can respond to clicks anyway. Okay, there are two entities to concern ourselves with. Uh, the entities are photons and electrons. And a photon is, uh, is a wave. It is also called a particle, and you might just put that in quotes, because it has all this wave character. It's an electromagnetic wave, and as all the diagrams show, the two fields, electric and magnetic, are perpendicular to each other. Um, this diagram here uh, it demonstrates wavelength, and it's that little, if the cursor shows up, that little bar here. It's either node to node or peak to peak, so this, this shows a whole wave from one node to another node. Uh, the energy of a photon is proportional to the frequency of the wave. Now, that's the way physicists like to talk about it. Uh, most of the rest of the world and chemists like to talk about wavelengths. So it's just it's the inverse of that. The shorter wavelengths have high energy, the longer wavelengths have low energy. The uh, blue end of the visual spectrum I have to talk about is the short and high energy side of the spectrum. The red end is the lower energy. I thought I would 
kick things off with a little demonstration of quantum leaps. You might not expect to run into this in your daily lives, but you actually do mm -hmm. all the time. So if I show you how these things are stimulated, these are some fluorescent business cards. Mm -hmm. Everybody should be able to see that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's happening here is that the uh, light is being stimulated, or the uh, electrons are being stimulated. The electrons in the dyes that are within these plastics are being stimulated by this rather high energy, uh, well, it doesn't show up much here, but this rather high energy la laser. And we'll get into that uh, when we start talking about uh, absorbance and fluorescence. <coughs> here is the diagram of <coughs> the uh, energy and how it responds according to wavelengths. Our visible range is uh, in the region of 400 to about 750 nanometers. Again, the blue side is over here on the left. The red side is over here on the right. Next to it are the ultraviolet, uh, which has even more energy photons. And then on the other side is the infrared. It starts with near infrared, then it goes to far infrared. Uh, it goes on you know, terahertz of microwaves, radio waves, very long radio waves. Uh, one of the things I want to, one of the words I want to use tonight is uh, antenna. Now, when you want to receive something in the radio wave region, you use a conductor that is some inches long, from here to, to here to whatever, in order to catch the wave. Uh, another way of thinking how uh, photons are caught in the visible range is also with thinking of them as antennas, but they're going to be much smaller. They're going to be on the size of molecules. And I should say off the ultraviolet side here, you'll see you start coming up against the wall as wavelength gets smaller and smaller. Uh, it, it can't actually reach zero in, in wavelength, but beyond ultraviolet are x-rays, uh, beyond that are gamma rays, which are really quite dangerous, and uh, then maybe right up Near the wall are some strange cosmic ray particles. Yes? Uh, your little mouse thing is not showing on the TV, so oh, well. I think you're trying to show us something, but we're not seeing it. Okay. Uh, and I don't think, point that with your I don't think pointers will work either, but I'll try to I'll keep that in mind. I shouldn't really need that too much. Okay. So this is the visible color range. Uh, shown in, in color, so that you can see that uh, from, uh, and this one cuts off at 700. It's kind of debatable. I mean, this isn't a, there isn't a sharp line for this. Uh, and this is for people with typical responses in their retinas. There are some people, uh, and I should say in uh, World War II, it was found out that there were some German pilots who had an additional color receptor in their retinas, and uh, it was found that they were particularly good at telling what was real camouflage and what was leaves. So the Germans did screenings for their pilots to see who had that ability. I don't think we did. I mean, maybe we just didn't find out until after, after the war. This is eye response. Uh, perhaps you can see the uh, different colors. You have three receptors for color. Red, green, and blue. Uh, you have an additional receptor which is in the blue-green range and those are found in your rod cells. The other three are found in your cone cells. Uh, the reason that you don't have a blue-green receptor is that those receptors are wired uh, differently from the red, green, and blue receptors. It goes uh, through the nerve fibrils to a different part of the brain and it is used differently, and I'll touch on that. And you can see the visible spectrum down below as to uh, what colors actually correspond to the peaks in these. <coughs> Something you may have noticed before is that, uh, no, no, go ahead. 
click the next slide here. There we go. When you look at blue, it actually kind of, I mean, the way violet happens is that it's so blue that it turns reddish. And you may follow this line from right to left of the red profile, how the red receptor uh, responds to light. When it gets down towards that far left region, it picks up again. And uh, by no coincidence, because if you take a look at the numbers down at this end, they are about half of what they are at the other end. And this is just like uh, strumming a guitar string, you know, but things in a different octave. Uh, when you have a frequency that is double or half, you're going to have these harmonics and uh, the other string in an instrument is going to respond. And that's the same deal with the uh, wavelength of light. Here's a diagram of the uh, receptors and they actually do look like rods and they actually do look like cones. There's an antenna that I talked about that is of the order of a molecule length. The molecule is called retinal, and specifically cis-retinal, and I'm showing it here in the uh, lower right-hand corner. Uh, something interesting is that the same antenna is used for receiving all of the colors, all of the color signals. And I'm going to tell you why it all works out. <coughs> this is an opsin. The opsin is a protein. And uh, I did this drawing to show you the more or less cylindrical regions of the protein. What I didn't draw in are the little connectors. There's a little strand for each one of these rods that connects one to the other. So it's all one big protein. And to remind you, or tell you if you didn't know already, what a protein is, um, it is like a bunch of pop beads. There are 21 amino acids, and you get to choose whatever color pop bead you want and pop one against another. Each one has different properties. So changing one of them can make some drastic changes to a protein. And some diseases actually happen that way. Inside of this, this forms like a, a cup arrangement. And inside of it sits the retinal, the cis retinal. <clears throat> there are sections of these proteins that want to associate themselves with particular parts of the retinal. So once the protein is formed and there's retinal there, if you've eaten your carrots, because it, it's a carotenoid and it goes through retinoic acid, retinol, and to retinal, which is an aldehyde. So parts of this molecule get grabbed or associated. They don't get bound, really, but they do get associated with parts of this cup formed by the protein. Now there are, uh, I should say, what the actual reaction is, is that when a photon is caught by this antenna, then uh, it absorbs that energy of the photon. And that energy is enough to uh, excite the electrons in that molecule, within that antenna, and allow a <coughs> transition from the cis, which is bent, to the transform, which is a more straight molecule. That little action is enough to trigger a sequence of events that results in the bottom of that nerve fiber, or that nerve cell, sending a signal down the nerve fiber, and it goes on into your brain. Most of your actual seeing is in your brain. Now, <coughs> people have been excited to learn that the mantis shrimp has 15 color receptors. And uh, it's been said, wow, it must be great. They must be able to see technicolor compared to us. Mm -hmm. That's not true. We have much better ability to, to distinguish colors. Uh, 
our brains are more sophisticated and it is synthesizing all kinds of algorithms and producing colors. Uh, I should mention that each of these opsins uh, has a name. You know, there's, there's an opsin that is made for red receiving, uh, one made for blue, one made for green, and also one that is made for the uh, rods. It's called rhodopsin. Here's what the brain does. Um, the nerve fibrils that go into parts of the brain are used to produce a third color. I don't know if you've ever wondered about this or not, but if you take, just look at the color sensors we have, and if you take red and blue, red blueness is violet or magenta. If depending on the balance that you use. Um, and that kind of makes sense. And uh, what doesn't make sense, and what, another thing that makes, makes sense is green blueness is cyan, blue green. What doesn't make sense is that red green is yellowness. Um, it doesn't seem like it should work that way. It does work that way, but only because of the trickery that your brain is using. What it's doing is it's taking the red signal and the green signal and it's looking at the difference and it's looking at the sum and comparing them. It takes that result and it determines how to factor in intensity. Now some of these diagrams take the rod cell signal and put in where you see that white and black decision point that's telling it what the intensity is. And then it takes that and it looks at the difference between that signal and the blue signal, and it makes a new thing called yellow. So yellow is all in your minds. Okay. Here is my own theory of, uh, and I do want to say it's my theory of the uh, evolution of yellow color, and I call it the banana theory. So back when we were little lemur-like creatures hiding in the trees, uh, eating berries and fruits, we knew that a lot of the green things we ate were going to make us sick. Uh, but we could tell the ripe berries if they were black or blue, or we could, you know, we could see cherries and strawberries and apples. Uh, but we had trouble with the, uh, the mangoes and the pears. Uh, we had trouble with the, you know, the bananas for that matter. Uh, there are a lot of yellow fruits, and what, there are two problems there. Now, one is you'll get sick if you eat something that's not right. The other problem is that you gradually decrease the food supply if you don't let the fruits mature so that their seeds mature and fall to the ground. So my theory is that yellow was created so that we could find more food. Uh, the Department of Transportation also uses yellow because it's, it's one of the most recognizable colors. I mean, it really stands out if you think about it. So when they want to tell you you're approaching a school zone or that the road ahead is going to make a sharp turn to the right or that the bridge is out, they're going to use a bright yellow sign. So in this process, a whole new fundamental color is put in. Now you can blend green and yellow and make yellow green. You can blend yellow and red and make orange. And that makes sense. Now when a photon is caught by one of these antennas, uh, what's happening is that an electron wave is being kicked up in energy. And there are a whole lot of options that this excited electron wave has. The, uh, I don't think we'll go through all this list because we'll, we'll kind of get into it gradually. But fundamentally it starts with uh, the first quantum jump, which is uh, a jump of the rest, the 
typical position of the electron wave uh, to the next level. And it only gets that by getting energy from the photon. That is a step where you do not see the, uh, the uh, jump as far as from these uh, fluorescence examples. You do see it in absorbance. If, uh, here's these blue tickets. So what's happening here is that photons are coming in. They hit the dye within this paper. And the dye absorbs the orange photons. And it uses the energy of those orange photons. And eventually what it's going to do is just basically just heat up that paper a little bit. So the, dye in, in, the uh, photon energy get, just gets absorbed and used in that way. It doesn't fall back down immediately and release the photon in the way that fluorescence does. Uh, in fluorescence, the energy wave that has absorbed the photon, gone to a higher level, will eventually, will actually almost instantly relax. And when it falls back to its rest level, it actually gives off a photon. There's a little bit of difference in the energy of the photon that comes in, the energy of the photon that comes out. Uh, it is always a longer wave photon or a color that's more on the red shifted than the photon that was used to excite the electron wave. Reflection. So here's one of the things that can happen with a photon. In metals, there are a lot of electrons that can move around in the surface. So there becomes this large field of negatively charged electrons that a photon encounters. And it's actually repulsed by that in an elastic collision, which is sort of like a billiard ball hitting the edge of a billiard table. It just bounces off. Now, I've the scale at the bottom is in micrometers. You have to multiply by 100. And it shows you that still that the uh, visual scale is between uh, 400 and 750 nanometers. What you can see is that there are a lot of the differences between the metals shows up outside of the visible, visible range. Uh, if we take a look, for example, at gold, AU, you can see that for things that are yellow, green, and below, yellow, green, blue, and violet, the photons are more absorbed than they are reflected. But the light that is yellow, orange, and red adds together to give you that pleasant gold color. So those photons actually are reflected, and you get to see them. As you'll notice with copper, it's shifted even more to the right. So there's more orange and red that is reflected. Uh, Something to notice about aluminum, it is highly reflective from the UV into the infrared. This is why it makes a great coating for mirrors for telescopes. Because you can see all the energies of the photons. Gold, on the other hand, uh, you'll remember that gold was the coating put on the uh, James Webb telescope. That's because its new emphasis is to look for uh, mostly things in the infrared region. And gold is the best reflector of infrared light. You can, so you can follow that blue line that's representing gold. Uh, another thing that might occur to you is that if a person had a rock with a lot of metal flakes in it, and you just had some sensors, let's say, a couple selected in the UV, a couple selected in the visible range, a couple selected in the IR, that by the ratios of those things, you could figure out which metals were each of those little specks. It's true. It's spectroscopy. However, you might get fooled by <laughs> <old school. laughs> uh, But your fancy instrument would not. The uh, sulfides of uh, iron and of lead are much less reflective. 
And uh, this is just showing the visible range, but they do differ also in the ultraviolet and infrared. So uh, while your eye might be fooled and you might think you're rich, your fancy instrument <coughs> measures the ratios of these various photon colors will not be fooled. Okay, here's one of our uh, <coughs> favorite minerals uh, here in the southwest. Uh, you can see uh, about all the colors that are shown on this graph in the, these samples of turquoise. And I've tried to match the color of, of each of these profiles on the right with those colored dots, which are uh, uh, green, blue-green, and that very nice uh, robin's egg blue. Mm -hmm. It tends to be that more iron related to copper, this is a phosphate, uh, more iron related to copper gives you more of that blue color. More copper gives you more of the green color. Uh, but it also depends a little bit on the oxidation state of, of the iron. Uh, that will also pick up, uh, it, you know, change this profile some. But more iron, more nice blue color. Are you sure it's not the other way around? Because <laughs> I think uh, it's the copper that makes the blue and the iron rich ones are, are greener. Well, this is this we is the way this out. is the way I, I read it. I will. I'll check it out. But I, I think this is the way it is. I did run up against some contradictory information um, you know on on other minerals. I didn't run up you know, but I'll look again. I didn't run up with any contradiction there. Because uh, copper minerals are normally blue and iron minerals are usually green. Yeah, we're so. going to talk about some. Uh, although, uh, iron does give some blue. Uh, you know, being a chemist, I'm used to seeing uh, many of these metals, or metal ions, in a solution. Uh, for example, uh, potassium permanganate, deep purple. Uh, copper sulfate, deep blue, but uh, the way we see them in this environment is different than what happens in, in a particular environment. Uh, and that is because these metals that are, add color to something are adding color to usually a silicate or an aluminous, luminosilicate or <coughs> alumina, uh, corundum, and there's already a lattice there. The lattice is pretty tight, let's say, of, of uh, silicon dioxide. <coughs> and you're creeping this metal in, which is much better, much bigger than, let's say, uh, the silicon atoms. It's going to grab the oxygens and whatever. It's not going to be in the same situation that it was in, in like a glass of water. Uh, because it's going to feel the, all the fields, and it's going to feel tensions from that lattice that it's trying to squeeze into. But that changes the energy levels. Uh, they're, you know, it's like when I said the antenna for retinol uh, was just slightly squeezed and twisted by the different opsins. There's not much of a change at all, but a little bit of difference changes those energy levels. That amount of energy between the low level and the high level determines what photon can be absorbed. If it doesn't have enough energy, it doesn't happen. It doesn't get absorbed. Uh, and so the local environment of the species does matter. I am going to mm -hmm. check that out though. <coughs> Lapis lazuli. Very blue. I'll catch up here. All right. Uh, Lapis lazuli is an, an aluminosilicate, uh, aluminosilicate base. Um, it, it's basically uh, a version of sodalite. Mm -hmm. It's also called ultramarine, particularly when it's ground up. It is the pigment that was used by the Egyptians to paint on the walls of their tomb when they needed a blue color. Um, one of the things it's done, it often has uh, some some pyrite deposited inside of it, 
So the first step is to drill all that stuff out, get rid of the pyrite, and then when you think you've got just all blue rock, grind it up into a blue powder, and you can use that as your, as your dye. It's unusual where the blue color comes from in this case. Sodalite has a structure to it with holes, and some of those holes uh, have a chloride ion, the chloride anion, so it's negatively charged, just rattling around in that hole. What is replaced uh, in lapis lazuli is the sulfur, or I should say tri-sulfur radical anion. Uh, very unusual, it would be a very hot thing to have if we had it in this environment. It would react with whatever it touches because it's actually a, a radical. But rocks are like a great bottle to hold, <coughs> to hold stuff for millions of years. As long as you keep reactive things away from a super reactive species, you don't have to worry about what happens to it. It'll, it'll stay as it is. So, the blue color comes from that trisulfur anion. Um, and it's really the only case I know of where the anion is primarily what's causing the, the color. Refraction. <laughs> when photons travel between two different materials, uh, at the interface the light beam is bent. And it is bent according to the energy of the photon. So what happens uh, is that, as you can see, uh, a prism shape will actually split out the colors and spread the spectrum out so that you can see the high energy there on the left and to the low energy on the right. Uh, it's actually the uh, high energy photons that are bent more. And it depends on the clear material that it goes through. Um, and we give the, the term refractive index to materials that bend to various degrees. And one of them that we just love is diamond. So a uh, nice thing about diamond is it has this very high refractive index. And what that's going to do with the photons is it's going to help sort them out to different parts of the... Uh, different parts of the diamond. So you're going to see all these little rainbow colors inside of it. Uh, it gives it a lot more zip, but it depends on the particular cut that the jeweler makes. Uh, about a century ago, the brilliant cut of diamond was discovered, uh, which really maximizes the path of the pho photons. And as you show in this diagram, if you <coughs> get the gem too long or too short, you're going to lose photons out the back or side, and you're not going to get as many coming back to your eyeball. Some materials have two refractive indexes. If it's material that is cubic, then it doesn't matter so much which way you look at it. I mean, it's still a cube, but if it's not cubic, if there's some distortion, to how the individual atoms are arranged, then by the position of the crystal, you can actually uh, experience two different refractive indexes, and photons can take two different paths. In this case, it's showing a uh, light that's polarized. I showed you that wave, you know, that, that, that had electronic component here, magnetic there. They're actually oriented in all possible positions. Uh, you know, all for 360 degrees, so the uh, electronic phase might run north-south or east-west or, or uh, northeast-southwest, uh, all jumbled together. But the ones that are oriented, let's say, east-west, and the ones that are oriented north-south experience two different paths because they meet the uh, crystal differently. And uh, the result is, you know, when looking backwards, you can see how two images come out of the uh, Iceland spar calcite. Now, uh, 
I don't know if it's recently or not, but it was found that big chunks of Iceland's bar calcite were found in Viking ships. And the reason for this is that it was used in navigation. So, use the stars at night, use the sun during the day, but if it's overcast, what, what do you do? I mean, you can't tell where the sun is. But you can take the Iceland calcite, and there's a way of rotating it, and how things shift. It makes a difference when you're looking straight on to where the sun is shining straight through the cloud, and where it's all reflection. So you can sample in the sky. I haven't tried this, but I really want to try it. Uh, there is a spot where everything will be closer together. And that's where the sun is hiding. Iridescence. Uh, this is called Schuller. I won't go into too, too much detail on this because I think you've covered it already in another, in another uh, epistle or talk. But what's happening here is related to, if you can see this, it's not a great image, but what this is is a Newton's rings device. There's a flat glass and there's a lens-shaped glass that are pressed together. At the point where they meet, there's no distance at all. But as you move out from that center point, there are uh, very gradually increasing distances. And a light beam that comes in reflects off of both of those interfaces, the curved lower interface, and it reflects off of the flat base <coughs> interface underneath. Uh, the reflected beam comes back up through on its way back to your eyeball. If those beams meet out of phase, in other words, the high part of the peak meets the lower part of the peak in overlap, then there will be destructive interference. Now if we use just something like a sodium light, what you would see instead of these rainbows, you would see just light and dark bands. And the regions of a particular gap distance would give you a reinforced wave and you'd see it strong. Another slightly different gap distance would give you darkness because the energy of the original wave and the reflected <coughs> wave cancel each other out. And when you have white light, what you see is uh, that because the photons have different wavelengths for the different colors, different parts or different gap lengths uh, allow that constructive interference and therefore you see the color rings. I might actually have to plug this in. This is, a, this is an illustration of that. You can see there's a slightly smaller gap on the right side than there is on the left side. On the left side, there's a bright band because the two beams, the main reflected one and the one reflected from uh, the upper surface, meet each other and positively reinforce each other. Peacock stones. I'll go ahead and get this out. Peacock stones uh, give their uh, colors near the surface. Okay, in the peacock stone, the, uh, the thin layer is at the surface. It's actually an oxide coating that forms over the uh, metal sulfide. And in the Labradorite, the most famous uh, mineral for, the, uh, for this iridescence, there are lamella layers. And lamella just means layer. Uh, these are on the order of a significant fraction of the wavelength of light that's going to be coming back out. So they're like uh, from 100 to 200 nanometers in the difference of those two layers. All right, let's... Let's consider what happens during absorbance. In absorbance, a photon interacts with an electron wave, and the photon is absorbed. As you can see, it, the photon or the electron jumps from its rest level up to a higher one. And it absorbance is. Uh, I should show this as 
that dark band is a really dark in the center and, and not so dark on the edges. But the concept is the same. It blocks out some of the color in part of the spectrum, lets you see what's left over. So if it's something that is centered around the uh, blue or blue-green region, you're going to see the yellows and oranges and reds. It's going to look red to you. Now this over here is a demonstration of the interference. A little hard to see, but basically this wave and this wave are uh, the opposite of each other. So if you combine them together, they're going to cancel each other out and flatline. That's what it's trying to demonstrate. The right hand <coughs> diagram, and I made this very poor little device. If you take a wave and you force it into a circle, as you know, if you can make an electron go right around the positively charged nucleus, the electron is moving so fast it has wave character. And it's going to meet itself. The head and tail meet itself. If it meets in a destructive way, it'll cancel out. That is not allowed. The only thing that's allowed is constructive interference, where the peaks and troughs of the wave match each other. Now, as you might realize, you can get there by expanding the diameter of this loop. And this is at the basis of the quantum jump. There's a difference in energy between the small diameter circle and the large diameter circle. And if you don't have that amount of energy, at least that much, nothing happens. But if you do, then the transition can take place. The electron can move from this wave pattern to the bigger wave pattern. Now that's, that's what happens if you draw that concept out on like a piece of paper in 2D. In 3D, the waves are conceptually a little different, but the same principle is involved. The basic shape is a sphere, and uh, that is the, uh, the wave of the electron. It can move up in energy, uh, but it has to move to a different wave pattern. It could, it could move up to a, depending on where you are in the periodic table, it could move up to a bigger sphere, it could move up to another family of orbitals, and I call these bubbles, because they look like bubbles. So there are four orbital types or families that you might deal with. They're called S, P, D, and F, uh, but only S, P, and D are in the uh, upper part of the periodic table, so that's all we're going to have to worry about. There are three of those dumbbell shaped, which are like a twisted balloon. Uh, there are four of the clover leaf shape, and then one that's kind of oddball that's a, a dumbbell and it has a donut shape in the middle. These can all be mathematically figured out. I think maybe at one time I actually did that. But I can't do it anymore. <laughs> so those energy jumps that we talked about where we just drew a line from one to another, that represents a shift in the wave pattern. So it might go from a sphere to a sphere, depending on where it is, or it might go from a, a sphere to uh, a different atomic norm, uh, orbital shape. The metals that we're fond of, uh, you know, like molybdenum, molybdenum, magnesium, chromium, iron, vanadium, all have their outer electrons in the d orbitals. It's only the outer electrons that are in play for color and actually for bonding too. The inner electrons are busy. So uh, what you're going to see is that heavier elements have at their lowest level one of these spherical waves. They'll have a bunch of the P-shaped waves, uh, some D waves, but uh, 
in that upper half of the uh, lower periodic table where all the interesting metals are that we deal with, the outer electrons are in the D. Uh, the reasons that the inner ones are out of play is that they actually have a layer of electrons on top of them. So they would have to go through that layer in order to interact with anything. So they're basically something that you ignore. We only see the chemistry and physics of, of interest <coughs> from the outer electrons. So those are the atomic orbitals. The atomic orbitals can be brought together, uh, particularly in the case of carbon, and what they do is combine their bubbles so that the electrons can spend time between two nuclei. Uh, and that's called bonding. It is merely the sharing of electrons. And here's an example of uh, butadiene. And you'll see that shape at the, at the bottom. Uh, one of the interesting things about sharing is that uh, when we get a, what's called a conjugated system that has alternating uh, double bonds, they're not really alternating uh, as far as the electrons are concerned, but they are, that does mean that they are shared. Uh, the electrons can actually spend time with around all those nuclei. Other patterns are shown here also that are possible for the electron to take, but they are jumps in energy. In the case of butadiene, the energy required is on the ultraviolet end. And you're not going to see any color from it. Butadiene is water clear. It's a relatively short antenna. If we go to a longer antenna, this is our retinal molecule. And because it's a longer antenna, it can interact with longer wavelength light. And in fact, in the range of, uh, of our color vision. Inorganic chemistry now. And this is where the D orbitals come into play. Uh, I suspect it's going to be pretty hard for you to see uh, inside of these structures. But we talk about molecular orbitals when we deal with carbon chemistry. But when we start dealing with metals and those D orbitals, uh, it's taken over by the inorganic chemists and they want their own name, so they call it <coughs> crystal field. It's really the same kind of thing, it's the sharing of electrons. Uh, so a much tighter complex forms if the electrons are actually shared and not just like a sodium chloride salt situation where it just positive, negative, positive, negative, and then an extra negative, positive, negative, positive. It's not just an electrostatic situation. There is actually electron sharing. But the same principles involved uh, and the energy uh, between different energy levels within inside of these structures allow it to absorb light that is in the visual, in the, uh, visual range. Therefore, these metal complexes are colored. Here is fluorescence. Uh, what happens during fluorescence is there's the initial step of absorbance. An electron moves to what's called the excited state, and that just means that it's taken the new wave pattern. Uh, almost instantly, it comes back. That is the fluorescence because as the energy drops back to the rest state, it releases a colored photon. And here's some fluorescence. I'll go ahead and read these for you since you can't possibly see them. Uh, from the left to the right is sodalite, then green fluorite, amazonite. Uh, they said beach rock, but I guarantee you not all beach rocks are going to fluoresce. Um, <laughs> Orthoclase feldspar, Franklin calcite, that's from the yellow to the reds, Iceland calcite, which is from the purples to the blue, agate, and a petrified wood sample. Uh, and on the right is corundum. Two things to notice here. One is that uh, there's a scale here of temperature from hot to cold. 
So, with now your knowledge of energy levels, uh, it, it might not surprise you that as you cool something down, the lattice <coughs> shrinks. You know, everything shrinks as it cools. When the lattice shrinks around the fluorophore centers, it changes those energy levels, and therefore the color changes. On the right is corundum, and you'll see some uh, mostly red fluorescence. Ruby is a corundum, and it gets an extra red kick from the red fluorescence that, that it has when responding to UV light. A little more life to it. Diffraction. Another toy. Diffraction is caused by a photon's interaction with an edge. And you can see diffraction by making a tiny slit on a piece of metal and shining light through it, or by a diffraction grating. Here is a uh, rather expensive but very nice diffraction grating. I'll just kind of wiggle it around because I'm not sure exactly where you will see that. And so there are about 30,000 finely etched lines per inch to make this style on the left here of interference edges. And this actually uh, came out of a spectrophotometer. That's Diffraction, uh, the edges uh, which make up the uh, situation for diffraction to happen can also happen with raindrops in a cloud. So basically, those raindrops uh, are acting as edges and causing diffraction. And what this causes is a sun dog in the sky. It's wavelength dependent as to how much diffraction you get. So. Uh, you're looking at slightly different angles of the diffracted light. Now the wonderful thing is that you can replace those droplets of water with spheres of silica. And between those spheres of silica, diffraction can happen. And that's what gives opal its color. The Smaller spheres uh, diffract the smaller wavelengths of light. So these 200 nanometer spheres shown on the left are diffracting a blue. The larger 320 nanometer spheres uh, have spaces that allow the red light to diffract. And these arrangements occur in patches in the bowl. So you'll have a bunch of smaller here, a bunch of larger spheres there, and you get this wonderful assembly of patches that interact with light with different color. There's another phenomenon, uh, which I think <coughs> you've talked about before, chatoyance. Mm -hmm. uh, chat is the French word for cat. So this is a cat's eye. Um, it's actually called by very fine, caused by very fine rutile fibers. Uh, titanium dioxide uh, are in, included in the mineral. In star sapphire, you can actually see uh, evidence of the uh, rutile in a sort of hexagonal pattern, which makes a six pointed star. Diopside uh, makes a four pointed star. And uh, it's important uh, in order to get these stars to show up. And, and nice and even that the polishing will be done exactly right. That's called asperism. I'm just showing you this uh, because silica is uh, so common. It's SiO2, but if you'll look, you'll see that each of these white silicon atoms is actually sharing half of the oxygen atoms, half of the four oxygen atoms around it with another silicon atom. 
So uh, the way to summarize this kind of structure is to draw a little tetrahedron that kind of represents the, uh, the oxygen atoms at the, at the points. And where they are shared, or points are shared. Um, this shows you three of the classes of silicates uh, in, in rings and strings, uh, basically sheet networks. There are also uh, a class called neosilicate, another one called tectosilicate, which is a little more complicated. <coughs> There aren't, um, the, the outer electrons that help bind all this together, that are shared between two nuclei, are only shared between two nuclei. <coughs> that is why light just goes right through these things. The photons tend to interact with um, electron waves that are spread out, not those that are busy holding two nuclei together. But the ones that are spread out are, are like, bigger antenna areas, and they can catch the photon. So, let's get into rocks. The, uh, the silica on the left and the silica on the right have red colors, but for different reasons. Rhodonite is an inosilicate. It has actually the, the stringy silica and uh, manganese is included in that framework. What the manganese does is it actually grabs hold of some of the oxygens that the silicons used to have, which is stronger. And that whole field of the oxygens around the manganese is, uh, now makes a crystal field that is its antenna, and it can catch uh, greenish photons. In the case of uh, chalcedony, which is also a silica, it is uh, iron that gets in. Uh, that's a carnelian, um, a very uh, old and popular gem. And the iron does the same thing, but there's a slight, slight difference in color. Red tourmaline, it's sort of a reddish purple uh, tourmaline. It is caused by uh, manganese, again, getting into the framework. But this framework is not the same as the SiO2 silica. Uh, we'll get to the formula for, for tourmaline. It's, it's really quite complicated. It's not just a, a silica. And therefore, the matrix that, that manganese complex joining itself with oxygens. Uh, in the one case, it's under different sorts of pressures from the lattice than it is in the other case. There's a slight difference in color. Red diamond. Uh, you'll probably never see a red diamond. Um, it is not entirely settle what causes the color in red diamonds. The most popular theory is that uh, the color is formed at very deep levels of very high pressures and that the diamond actually gets bent and bonds broken. Now, anywhere else, uh, the diamond would just break. But there is so much pressure that any break that starts to form gets squished back again. So what, what, what they're saying is that there is plastic deformation. Now diamond is nothing but carbon. And uh, it's single bonded carbon, meaning that the electrons are shared between just two nuclei. They're not spread out. They don't make a good antenna, so the diamond doesn't absorb colored photons. In the case of red diamond, if you break some of those bonds, some of them will reform to single bonds, but some of them won't. They're now disconnected, and they're going to have to make what's called double bonds. Uh, and in double bonds, different orbitals are used, and it tends to spread out the uh, electron wave. And it spreads out enough, it's going to be an antenna for the photons. And that seems to be what's happening. Uh, the other theory is radiation effects. 
uh, gamma rays will break bonds. So, and there's plenty of cases of gamma rays breaking bonds and the bonds try to reform, but again, they're not exactly lined up right, and so they go to the alternative and form a different kind of bond. Ruby. Ruby is corundum. And I don't know why, but when I changed from one computer to another, uh, PowerPoint decided to shift some things around. This should say Al203, so it's aluminum oxide. Right in the middle of this crown is a big ruby. It's not the richest red ruby, but it is a nice big ruby. And what happens in that case is among this Al203 matrix, uh, some chromium gets in, and that chromium ion is bigger than the aluminum, uh, replaces the aluminum, latches onto the oxygens, and is now uh, in a crystal field, able to serve as an antenna for color. But it's squeezed a little bit by all the aluminum oxide lattice around it. Orange imperial topaz is a, a neosilicate and uh, uh, we should say that, that topaz is one of those gems that could be you know, virtually any color but it's, it's the aluminum that's added to the silicate plus the fluoride that gives it its yellow color. Uh, orange sapphire, as we said, sapphire is a corundum, but if uh, vanadium sneaks in, replaces some of the aluminum, then uh, an orange color is given. Synthetic sapphire uh, in the orange shade is made with beryllium. So in the one case, you've got a, a larger ion ion getting in, replacing aluminum, in the other, a smaller one, because beryllium is, is a smaller cation. It, it changes that lettuce. Sphalerite is zinc sulfide, um, and it can take up iron. Uh, iron in the ferric form tends to be uh, a yellow color, and it is preserving some of that characteristic when it gets into the, the, the uh, aluminum oxide matrix and starts taking over some of the oxygens and coordinating with them. Again, the principle here is that you're making an, an antenna, a receiver basically, for a particular color of photon. Spessarite garnet is an aluminosilicate with man manganese. Um, the addition of additional manganese and uh, ferric ion gives it its orange color. And finally, a uh, different material, calcium titanosilicate of sphene. The color is given by iron uh, and aluminum getting into that silicate structure. Uh, but these spheins tend to form in areas of the earth where there are the rare earths, the heavier elements. So if you have a sphene, uh, expect it to be radioactive. It will pull up cerium, thorium, yttrium, so you should find all of them actually being radioactive. Another property of this particular gem is that I think you can see this is uh, dichroic. I mean, it's not only yellow, but the refractions inside of it split into red and green. Okay. Uh, Beryllium in an aluminosilicate makes a barrel. This has beryllium, it has aluminum, but it doesn't have the silicon. So it's not a barrel. And it is iron getting into this matrix and uh, replacing aluminum <coughs> and uh, coordinating with those oxygens and making a new crystal field that gives it the receptivity of the uh, blue light that turns it yellow. So, Christ of Beryl is not a barrel, in spite of the name. Apatite is calcium phosphate, um, and it can take up 
chloride or chloride or hydroxide. Your bones are also calcium phosphate, you know, and they can take up fluoride. Um, but if your bones were made of apatite, they would be quite brittle. Your body gets around this by including some protein to disrupt a lot of the crystallization. And it, so there's some protein strands inside your bones with that apatite, the calcium phosphate. Uh, its color comes from radiation or rare earths operating upon the, and, it, and it, it's not necessarily in the gem, but where the, the gem forms, it has received a lot of radiation. And that has uh, ruptured bonds and reformed them. Citrine is a quartz. Uh, and it has iron oxide entering inside of it to give it the yellow color. Here's a real barrel, Heliodor, which means the sun. And it is iron again getting into this uh, beryllium aluminosilicate lattice structure <coughs> that causes the yellow color. And it's probably iron plus three, which is the ferric form. And here's an example of a tectosilicate. It's pretty complicated. Uh, structure. The addition of uh, calcium and sodium uh, cause a yellow color. I'm slightly mystified as to why that is. Not everything is explained. But it's the only tectosilicate example that I had, so I put it in here. Uh, green diopside, let's say magnesium and calcium silicate. When chromium gets in, uh, and chromium is, uh, is, is really pretty good at adding color to gems and a number of other things. And chromium gets in and coordinates with the oxygen and competing with the magnesium and the calcium. Uh, its crystal field is just right for absorbing uh, the greenish light, or the, the uh, red light. And so you get green color. <coughs> Saberide is one of the gar garnets. Uh, and again, an aluminosilicate, and chromium can give it its green color, or vanadium. These are much bigger cations than the calcium, or the aluminum, or the silicon. So they put a strain on the matrix. Peridot is a pleasant lime-colored gem. I mean, it's actually uh, derived from olivine deep in the earth. The uh, amount of uh, iron that it has in uh, essentially controls how much color it has. And uh, one of our favorite green gems is the emerald. It is a barrel. Uh, the BE part comes from beryllium. So it's a beryllium aluminosilicate. And again, if vanadium or chromium ion uh, is allowed to diffuse into the barrel as it's forming, then the color is, uh, is a rich green. And that's because it makes a nice big crystal field, a great antenna for red photons. And here's the formula for green tourmaline. Um, and you can actually have green and red in the same in the same tourmaline. And there's a black tourmaline called Shore. Uh, when the uh, Dutch East India Company sent ships to India to get spices and Asia to get tea, uh, people would stuff that Shore, that black tourmaline, in their pockets, take it back because the alchemists in Europe were just fascinated with things like lodestones, and they were fascinated with tourmaline because when you heated it up in a cooking fire, the ashes that come up glom onto it. And in fact, the Dutch word for tourmaline is something that essentially sounds like ash attracting. It is uh, copper and chromium that uh, sneak in here. Uh, one of the unique things about this gym is it has boron in it. Pretty complicated.
sapphire is, is a corundum. Uh, corundum would naturally be clear. And it's kind of interesting how the color develops here. Um, there is a titanium cation in the usual state, plus four state, that replaces some of the aluminum. Uh, there's also some ferrous ion uh, in the gem. And what happens is, it's a little bit like what happens in a battery when uh, one metal decides it wants the electron more than another metal. And so it takes it. Um, an electron is transferred from the iron to the titanium. So the titanium 4 is going to go to titanium 3, and uh, the iron is going to go from iron 2 to iron 3, iron 3 plus. So that is what gives sapphire its blue color. Aquamarine. It is a real barrel. Its color comes from both the ferrous, the Fe plus 2, and the ferric ion, plus 3. The, the greenish color comes from the plus 3. The bluish color comes from the plus 2. Blue diamond. A lot can be said about blue diamond. This is, in fact, the hope diamond. And it was, uh, it was really a mystery as to what causes the blue color. Uh, somebody who was a really good talker in a laboratory talked the Smithsonian into letting them uh, take the Hope Diamond, put it under a machine and zap it, and actually bore a little bit of a hole in the, the back surface, and then analyze what came off. And what they found was boron and nitrogen. In fact, if you look at these spectroscopic data on boron nitride, you're going to find that you know, it should that should give a blue color. That might just be coincidence, but it is boron and probably boron coordinated to nitrogen that's responsible for the blue color. At least that's where things stand today. So keep your eye out for any updates on that. Uh, I don't think they're going to let anybody bore more holes into the Hope Diamond. As it turns out, the Hope Diamond is phosphorescent. If you hit it with UV light, it gives off a red or orange glow. Uh, and one of the diamonds in the setting actually gives off a blue phosphorescence. So what is phosphorescence? It's just like fluorescence. Uh, there's absorption of photon, it goes to a new wave pattern, but instead of instantly falling back and releasing a photon in fluorescence, it hangs around a while. There's an extra step involved, and that step takes time. Uh, much of it happens quickly, but it fades off slowly. And in fact, the phosphorescence, even this phosphorescence, if you use the right instrument, you'd find out that months later there's still red photons being given off by this thing from that initial UV pulse. And it, it's theorized that that phosphorescence is, is largely caused by uh, a complexation of a boron with nitrogen. And it's called a, a donor acceptor uh, situation. Okay, we're almost at the end here, but I want to touch on violet. Corderite is a, another aluminosilicate. It has magnesium and iron in it, uh, the iron giving you the uh, purplish blue color. The interesting thing about it is it's pleochroic because of that peculiar lattice structure. Uh, when you hold it in one direction, it's purple. Uh, depending on the sample, we hold it in another direction, it's either clear or yellowish. Amethyst is our most popular uh, violet colored gem. 
In this case, uh, iron replaces silicon, uh, but the violet color comes from being irradiated. So where this is formed, I, I mean, these usually have a, have a host rock, like you'll find a lot of amethysts inside of a geode, and the host rock can be radioactive deep in the earth. And what's happening is that iron 3 goes to an unusual iron 4 state. And normally this would, wouldn't hang around, but the iron 4 is locked inside of a very nice bottle of quartz. So it hangs around. And it happens to coordinate with oxygen and give the kind of crystal field that takes up yellow wavelength photons. And that leaves you with purple color. And finally, tanzanite, a very beautiful uh, bluish purple gem, calcium aluminosilicate, a little bit complicated in its lattice structure, but the color comes from vanadium. So once again, this vanadium ion gets in, coordinates with the oxygens, makes the crystal field, becomes a great antenna for yellow light. And by taking out the yellow light, you're left with the purple. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Uh, I know there's there's stuff that might kind of blow up some heads, but there are people in here, because I talked with them, that have been through this stuff before, and uh, so anything that's mysterious. I can try to answer questions for you, uh, but you have people among you too that, that can do that. Uh, this is my email. Uh, I live in Palmer Lake, if you happen to get by that way. Uh, this is one of the last pictures of me at, at, actually at work. Uh, at work playing with a combination of a, a children's toy and a dog toy to <coughs> make a virus model. <laughs> <laughs>